please take your Bibles and join me in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, for the reading of God's word, and you can follow along in your scriptures as I read, beginning in verse 1 and down through verse 15. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers, making request that perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may encourage together with you, while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Father, as we give this portion of our gathering together to the worship of our God through your word, the study of your word, the proclamation of your word, we pray that you will be glorified in our hearts. We will see the majesty of our God and our Savior. And Father, it will draw us to love you more, to serve you more, to worship you with more zeal, to become more faithful in our devotion to you. Use your word then to sanctify your church. And we pray also for those that may be among us who are yet without Christ, that don't have that security of knowing that their sins are forgiven. They belong to Eternal heaven belongs to them. Would you move and direct in their hearts, doing the work that only you and you alone can do? We thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to be here. We thank you for a building that keeps us warm and dry. We thank you for each one that is gathered in your presence here today. But more than that, we are thankful that you are present here with us. Your spirit is among us, indwelling us. And we give thanks to you, Father, for the written word. Lead and direct us now as we worship together under the authority of our God's voice this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Well, you can tell my voice is still struggling a little bit. This time it is not a cold. It is an allergy to a kitten that is now (laughs) residing in our house. In our previous lessons from our new studies in Romans, we have done an introduction to Paul as the author of this letter, as well as an introduction into the gospel, which is the dominant theme of this letter. We took the introduction of Paul two weeks ago as we opened this study, and last week we had an introduction into the gospel in which Paul is going to take us into deeper doctrines of that blessed gospel as we move ahead in this study. But he opens this letter in a very unique way, and I'm going to touch on the uniqueness in just a moment by taking the gospel and giving us a brief introduction to it, which we did last week, but even that, that introduction into the gospel leads the Apostle Paul to introduce the very recipients of this letter. And in identifying or introducing the recipients of this letter, it really is an introduction to what all believers possess in Christ. This is an introduction to all of us that by faith have received Christ as our Savior. So this morning, as we venture from verse 1 to verses 2 to 4, and now from verse 4 to 5 is our study today, we are going to consider an introduction 
to the, the recipients of this letter. And I'm referring to this as a saint's introduction because that's the language of Paul in verses 4 through 7. Now, we're not going to make it through verse 7 because this is our communion Sunday. I've cut kind of this series off a little bit, the introduction to the saints. But the letter to the Roman believers has a noticeably longer greeting than do the other New Testament letters written by Paul. That's what makes Roman a little bit unique in this introduction. If you look at Paul's other letters, the introductions follow a similar pattern. He, he introduces himself by name. He will say some statement of greeting, and he will often say, and this is to the Ephesian believers or whatever. He does the same here with Romans, but you'll notice it's much, much more expanded. And that is because as Paul opens the letter saying, this is Paul, he introduces himself. And he said, I am at the last of that introduction, verse 1, set apart for the gospel of God. That seems to arouse in Paul an excitement over the gospel. And therefore, he jumps into something of an introduction of the gospel, which will be the theme of this letter. And he comes down to speaking about the, the, the very centerpiece of that gospel, being Messiah, Jesus Christ. Notice how he identifies him in verse 4. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that almost arouses Paul again as he then moves into the recipients of the letter. He doesn't say simply, hello, Roman believers, I'm about to give you some gospel doctrine. Rather, he identifies the very people that are reading this letter. You would think, okay, they know who they are. But Paul goes into the spiritual identification. This is who you, this is who we are as saints in Christ. And it is a brief introduction, but nonetheless, it is important. Because this is identifying all who have embraced Jesus Christ by faith. We are the called ones. We're the saints of God because of what Christ has done for us, because Jesus Christ is now our Lord. And I'm going to emphasize the Lordship of Jesus Christ just a bit this morning in looking at the introduction of the recipients of this letter. What I think is also true of Paul's introduction is that you can follow the path of his zeal, his, his anticipation in writing this letter. Remember, he's never been to Rome yet. He wanted to go there. He wanted to do a work among the Roman believers. He no doubt in the 25 years of his ministry has heard something of the church that's in Rome. And he knew that this church was not under any apostolic ministry. And so he had a passion to be there among them and to have some fellowship with them. And I love the picture that he gives in the opening words that we just read. I want to get together with you so we can talk about our collective faith, mine and yours. And together we can grow in that. That's a picture of Christian fellowship that every believing church should enjoy. The love of just being together and exchanging what we have in Christ. My faith to you and your faith to me. And what it means to our growth. Paul was excited for that opportunity. But he hadn't been there yet. So he pens this letter in preparation. And perhaps if he knew that he perhaps couldn't be there... He knew that this letter would be important for them to read. So he says in verse 4, I speak of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Just thinking about the gospel and who is the very center of that gospel. Jesus Christ, the one that died and rose again. But when we embrace him by faith, we enter in under the kingship of this one, the Son of God. And this arouses Paul to speak about what that lordship looks like, what it, what it means to be a, a called one that comes under the embrace of the gospel so that we can be named as saints. It isn't just the hierarchy of the church that's a saint. I'm the pastor here, and I'm not a saint because I'm a pastor. I'm not a saint because I performed a miracle. I'm a saint because the God of heaven has called me into the embrace of his redeeming love through Christ. And so as every true believer, this becomes the passion that Paul has in introducing these Roman Christians to themselves. 
The mention of Jesus Christ the Lord excites Paul to the spiritual heart on how this relates to the people who confess him as Lord. And from this third part of Paul's introductory greeting, he identifies those who have been called into the gospel. What he writes in verses 5, 6, and 7 not only describes the saints in Rome. Again, this is a description of all who have called, been called into faith through the sacrifice of Christ who is now their Lord, our Lord. What Paul has done in greeting the church in Rome is that he has identified his calling by Christ to proclaim the gospel of God. We see that again repeated. What he did in verse 1, the the overtones of that are in verse 5 as well. He's been called to proclaim the gospel of God. A gospel that was promised to bring salvation to God's people through God's Son who has assumed lordship over all believers in a very marvelous way. And a central element of the gospel is that we have come under a new master and our hearts have been transformed to obey that master. We did not obey Christ before, but now as believers, we surrender to his lordship in our lives. We're no longer under the condemnation of sin, but we are also no longer under the bondage of sin. We have a new master, a new Lord. His name is Jesus. So Paul, in addressing these saints as called ones, he identifies first the call of obedience, and we see this in verses 4 and 5. And I'm thinking of the last part of verse 4 where Jesus Christ is identified as our Lord. And this verse 5 goes into that description of the call of obedience. This is as far as we're going to get this morning as we look at that call of obedience. The re- description of the recipients of this letter here in verse 4 through 7 is a description of all who have received the gospel of God by faith and have surrendered themselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ as is stated in verse 7 but it's repeated um, I'm sorry stated in verse 4 it's repeated again in verse 7 and this brings us to verses 4 and 5 where Paul moves from his vision of Jesus Christ as our Lord to what that meant for the writing of this letter Paul had received grace And he'd received apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith to the nations. These Roman believers were among those. They were among the nations that Paul was under calling to preach to. As it says and replies in verse 6. What is to be observed at the outset of our study is that the believers who are the called ones of this text are the believers who are the called ones of every generation. It's a description of all who have been brought into the gospel of God by faith. So we're beginning here, as we look at this, as those who are sent out by calling. Paul opens, verse 5, describing himself again as a sent out one. He is an apostle, which remembers a messenger or one that is sent out by God. He's an apostle sent out according to the grace of God. We're going to look at that for just a moment because this is very much part of the sainthood of these believers in Rome. Paul was not responsible necessarily or directly for their salvation because he had not been to Rome preaching the gospel. But as we looked at the history of the church in Rome, we see implications of the gospel from the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But there likely was also the migration of believers to the city of Rome that had been under the gospel influence in other cities where Paul had ministered. Whether or not those immigrants directly came under Paul's voice, no doubt they were influenced by the churches established in Paul's three missionary journeys. So he touches on, in verse 5, as he describes these saints as those that have been affected by an apostolic calling of God to preach the gospel to the nations. This passage twice refers to these believers as called ones, both in verse 6 and verse 7. Paul uses the very same word as called ones in those verses for his own self-description back in verse 1, where he was called, again, as an apostle. He was called out by God to be a a messenger for the gospel. 
And when we looked at verse 1, remember we ended up in Acts chapter 9, and we actually looked at the history of that calling. And I want to go back there just briefly because it has a direct bearing on what Paul is saying to these saints who are also called ones, called as saints. Paul uses, again, the same word. And when we think of Paul's calling as an apostle, we think of his, his conversion on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. After announcing to Paul, known then as Saul, that Jesus was the very one he was persecuting. Remember, he struck down on that road by the glory of Christ shining out of heaven. He falls prostrate. Who are you, Lord? Jesus said, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Then we follow up with the very next command. Get up, Jesus said. Enter the city and it will be told you what you must do. Get up, Jesus said. Enter the city, and it will be told what you must do. We then read that Jesus went to Ananias next. And he said, Ananias, I want you to go seek out Saul of Tarsus. He's in the city. Ananias was truly troubled by this for obvious reasons. And he said to him, Lord, this man is a troubler for the church. He arrests people. He has them murdered. Jesus didn't explain himself all that well to Ananias. He simply said to him, you go. He is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. For again, I want you to listen to the words of the Lord here to Ananias. For I must show him, Saul, how much he must suffer for my name's sake. This is the calling of Paul into that apostolic ministry for which Paul is writing to the church in Rome and identifying their sainthood that comes under this apostolic calling. It is important to listen carefully to the language used by Christ in Paul's conversion from Acts 9 because the calling that Jesus issued concerning Saul was not an invitation where Saul was to be asked to consider carefully Jesus Christ, and I want you to make a decision about me, us all. It was no open invitation given. Both Saul and Ananias were issued commands, get up and go. And both heard Jesus Christ declare, Saul must do this for me. That's the calling we're talking about here. So when Paul writes in verse 1 to the church in Rome that he's been called as an apostle, Paul clearly understood that Jesus had not given to him an open invitation, but rather a divine directive. A commandment was issued. Some have said a divine summons had been given to Paul. He went into the city as Christ instructed him. For three days he remained in Damascus, blind as you recall. On the third day, Ananias preaches the gospel to him. Paul surrenders his life by repentance and faith. Remember, the scales fall off of his eyes. But the spirit then comes and the spiritual eyes were opened as well. That's the symbolism of the scales falling off his physical eyes and his physical sight was regained. The Holy Spirit had entered into the picture and his spiritual, Paul saw then his, his spiritual eyes were opened. And once his eyes were opened by the Holy Spirit to see the saving grace that he was coming under, there was no refusing it. So Paul would never say, I was given an open invitation on the road to Damascus. Rather, he was given a command, a divine summons. Saul, Saul, you're going to put your faith in me, and I'm going to show you what you must suffer for me. This is the apostolic calling for which Paul is referring to. And this puts much more certain perspective, going back to Romans 1 verse 4, on the lordship of Jesus Christ that is declared in both 4 and verse 7. Paul is reinforcing the mandate that he received from the Lord to preach the gospel to the nations. Now, some of your translations use the word nations, preaching the gospel to the nations. Some, like mine, read Gentiles. 
And in truth, Paul preached to Jew and Gentile both, so the word nations could apply to both Jew and Gentile. But Paul writes this in the context of his calling from the Lord Jesus as an apostle who has been commissioned to bring the gospel now through this letter to Rome, which is predominantly Gentile. And we picked up on that in verse 13. But in Romans 11, verse 13, Paul clarifies this for us. And by writing these words, I am an apostle of Gentiles. 1 Timothy 2 7, Paul writes, For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling you the truth, I'm not lying. An apostle as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. This implies when Paul brings his apostolic credentials to the church of Rome, there in verse 5, he has in mind the Gentile nations, the Gentile people. That was largely his apostolic calling. He was called into this apostleship, ordained for him by Christ to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And so we see from this that Paul recognized his apostolic ministry as a man that is sent out to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul had received not only his apostleship from the Lord, but go back to verse 5, but he'd received grace and apostleship to bring this gospel message. Grace is a word that Paul specializes on throughout his writings here in the book of Romans. Some 21 times he goes back to that word grace, grace, grace. If the gospel is Paul's theme in Romans, certainly grace will be one of the most well-used descriptive words. And so bound are grace and gospel, those two words bound together, that in writing to the churches in Galatia, Paul was amazed that the believers were deserting that gospel because it was a desertion of the grace of God himself. The good news is about his grace, God's grace. We know God's grace to be his favor upon us, which is neither earned nor is it deserved. Paul saw the command of the Lord to be his apostle as a gracious calling. We see gospel and grace locked together. Paul sees his apostleship and grace locked together. Listen to what he writes in 1 Corinthians 15. I would encourage you to go there. 1 Corinthians 15 is that great resurrection chapter. And after Paul describes Jesus Christ being raised from the dead and 500 witnesses and all the apostles saw him, Paul says, and at last, I saw the resurrected Christ too. But he said, I was born in an untimely way. I'm odd man out. I'm not like the other apostles. There's something pathetically different about my apostleship, if I could use those words. Paul writes in verse 9 and 10 of 1 Corinthians 15, For I am the least <coughs> of the apostles. I'm the least of them. I'm not even fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's only his grace that called me into this ministry. And he goes on to say, his grace did not prove vain in me. I labored more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. What did Paul attribute his much labor to? He said, I worked harder than all the apostles, and I deserved that office less than any of them. What did he attribute his hard work to? Given this magnificent and painful and, and huge task of bringing the gospel to the Gentile world. That was God's grace toward me that made me work so hard. And we go back to Acts chapter 9. Not only was it hard work, but Jesus said, I will show him what he must suffer for me. So apostleship to Paul was much labor and a whole lot of suffering. And yet that too. Grace. I didn't deserve this, but God favored me with this ministry that's going to cost me a lot of hard work and a lot of suffering. Do you get Paul's perspective on his apostolic ministry here? 
This is a gracious act of God. He was an apostle entirely of grace. The thoughts of his abuse prior to Christ against the church were still etched on his memory. He said, I don't deserve this. And he's not saying directly, I don't deserve to suffer. What he's saying is, I don't deserve a ministry to proclaim the name of the Savior who is my Lord, my King, for whom I am privileged to suffer for, if that's what's required. I'm privileged to labor hard for him. That's how he honored Christ. That's how he valued the ministry of work and suffering that Christ had given to Paul. Nonetheless, three times Paul describes his apostleship as a calling of God's unmerited favor. Grace, grace, grace. God was gracious to Paul to enable him to to labor and suffer more for the name of Christ, even more labor than the other apostles. The Lord had blessed Paul to be the messenger of good news to the Gentiles. Work and suffering could not diminish the favor God bestowed on him to preach that message. Not only did the Romans understand the apostolic ministry given to Paul as one of authority from Christ, but now they understand this is something of much grace. Grace to Paul for preaching, but the grace that would overflow to this church for hearing these doctrines of the gospel, and he's going to mention that grace for the believers in verse 7. So not only was gracious God gracious to Paul, he's gracious to the church through the ministry of Paul. So that's a picture of Paul as the one sent out to speak to these saints. Then we look at further in verse 5, the believing that they did by calling. They had believed by calling. He writes in verse 5, the obedience of faith. And he repeats that same expression at the end of this letter in chapter 16 and verse 26. The obedience of faith. Paul received his commission and the grace to accomplish that commission from the Lord Jesus Christ for this purpose. To bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles or all the nations if you prefer. The obedience of faith is the expression that we need to focus on here. This is a description of the gospel proclamation that Paul had written to these believers. They were about to hear this expression. This is an expression that can be understood in two slightly different ways or two different interpretations. And this is reflected in our translations that probably some of us are using here this morning. If you have an NIV, it will read the obedience that comes from faith. While your ESV and your New American, like mine, will read the obedience of faith. And initially, those two renderings sound very similar. Yet according to the NIV translation, what is described is an obedience to the Lordship of Christ that comes from a genuine gospel faith. This, we would say, is the doctrine of the Lordship of Jesus Christ that we at this church strongly support and teach. We believe in the Lordship of Christ, meaning when somebody comes to faith, if it's a genuine salvation, they've accepted, they've embraced, they've believed and trusted in Jesus Christ, not only as their Savior, but their Lord and King as well. It's a believer that says, yes, I not only believe, but I will now submit to him. This is a doctrine we strongly believe in. And if the NIV is correct in that translation, they are stating what we as a church believe in, that Jesus Christ is not only Savior, he is our Lord. And we submit to him as our king, our sovereign. We absolutely reject the view of some today that believe you can be a true Christian and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, even though you may not submit to him as Lord. We reject that idea. That's a false faith. Jesus made clear that we will be known as his disciples, John 15, as we obey his commandments. John 13, as we love as he has loved us. This is how we are known to be his. James reminds us that faith without doing the works of Christ is what kind of faith? Dead. Dead. 
We do not obey Jesus to be saved, but when we are truly saved by his grace, our lives will be transformed to, to live obedient to his will. And Romans 8 will add further that if we do not walk according to the spirit of Jesus Christ, we don't belong to Jesus no matter the profession of faith that we make. And therefore, according to the clear teaching of God's word, we believe that genuine faith in the Savior will produce obedience to him as our Lord. However, going back to verse 5, there is another possible and perhaps more likely meaning here in verse 5. Paul can also be telling us that genuine faith is obedience to the word of God. The very act of faith is an act of obedience. Or genuine faith is obedience to the gospel of God. When we respond in true faith, it is an act of obedience. The literal reading from the Greek is to obedience of faith. And by this, it is meant that Paul was commissioned to call the nations to obey the call of the gospel by believing in Jesus Christ. Now, it may be a subtle difference, but both of those declarations that I've just presented, both of those possible interpretations are absolutely true of the gospel. In other words, true faith is an act of obedience to God's gospel. James Boyce writes, we could say faith, which is obedience. Faith, which is obedience. And this is the position held by many of the great commentators and theologians, among which is my favorite, one of my favorites, Martin Lloyd-Jones, also John Murray, Charles Hodge, Robert Haldane, Luther Calvin, James Montgomery Boyce, Frederick Godet, just to name a few. This is the position that they hold. And what this reminds us of is that the gospel is not preached as an option for men to consider, but rather as the command given by the God of heaven. From the perspective of God who created this plan of redemption, do you think God is making that an option for men? He is not. His son is not an option. His son is the only way. And when God proclaims his gospel, he is commanding all men everywhere to repent and believe. If men choose to disobey, they will be subject to his eternal condemnation. God is not so casual about his redemptive plan of salvation that he issued it as something that men can ignore or dismiss. It is a divine directive. We have that example again in Acts 9, don't we? The Apostle Paul. Jesus didn't come to him and say, I want you to consider something, Paul, here. Choice is yours. Rather, he stopped Paul in his tracks, or Saul, and said, I'm going to show you what you must do. I have appointed you to be an apostle. In Acts chapter 17, in verse 30 and 31, Paul preached to the Athenians, and he wrote these words, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, this is him preaching to the Athenians, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the work of righteousness through a man, speaking of Jesus, whom he has appointed, having furnished proofs to all men by raising him from the dead. The absolute proof of the gospel is a resurrected Savior. And God is saying to us through his gospel, you don't reject my son. He is the only way of salvation. I command, therefore, all men, repent and put your faith in him. To disobey that call is to submit oneself to the condemnation eternally of God himself. In Romans, this is how Paul presents the call of the gospel. It's a call of obedience to God's plan of redemption, whereby his son would die for his people. So this is not a light, casual manner with God. The gospel is a call by God to believe in what he has provided, to believe in his plan of redemption, to believe in his son. You don't ignore his son. You don't dismiss him. To reject the gospel is a rejection of God's Son 
and what he did in, in shedding his blood to purchase his people. What this view teaches is that unbelief or non-faith is a sin against God. Romans 6, verse 17, listen again to the language of Paul. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you are now committed. Romans 10, verse 3, and this is discussing the Jews' rejection of Christ. Paul writes, For not knowing about God's righteousness... Seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God, which is seen through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 10, verse 16. However, they did not all heed, again, speaking of the rejecting Jews, they did not all heed the good news or the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? And then Romans 16, as Paul closes out this letter, the second expression of obedience of faith. Paul writes, verse 25 through 27, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery for which long ages passed, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ. Be the glory forever. Amen. You know, when I share the gospel with lost people or I stand up here and preach, we will give an invitation. But bear in mind as we do so, God is declaring this is not an option. It is a commandment. And to reject this offer of salvation is a rejection of God himself. And that unbelief is sin. It is disobedience to God. The point that Paul makes from these passages is that faith in the gospel is a command from God that is to be believed. believed. Is this effective evangelism? Do you think this kind of presentation is going to make the gospel attractive to unbelievers? Well, did it work for the Apostle Paul? Look at Saul's conversion. Did it work for him? God did not give to Saul a choice. He declared, I've appointed you. And by his spirit, by the spirit of Jesus Christ, that man was brought to life spiritually, granted the gift of faith that he would believe. I would encourage any that's listening to my voice now, if you are an unbeliever, you're not sure, please see the gospel as a command of God given by his love and grace for sinners. The point that Paul makes from these passages is that faith is a gospel that is commandment from God to be obeyed. I trust that we can see from this review of God's word that both interpretations can be true. It may be debated which is meant in verse 5. But scripture does teach that a genuine saving faith in Christ produces obedience. It also teaches us that the gospel is God's call to the nations to respond in faith as an act of obedience in him. The result of faith is obedience, but the very act of faith is also obedience. And both will require a new heart. Both will require the Holy Spirit to come and do the work that man cannot do. In either case, faith and obedience, while they're not the same, they are bound together. As one author wrote, obedience always involves faith, and faith always involves obedience. God's call to believe is a call to obey the gospel, his provision of salvation to men through the sacrifice of his son. This brings us to our third point this morning, the glory that comes through this calling. Going back to Romans chapter 1, verse 5. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Verse 5 ends with a statement of purpose. Why is this all being done? Why the preaching, the apostolic ministry of grace from Paul to these saints? Why is God causing the grace of God to be pure Through his gospel. Why are these saints in obedience to that gospel receiving Christ? It is all for his namesake. 
Jesus Christ, our Lord, is to be glorified. Christ would be honored and glorified through the calling of sinners into salvation, as well as through the apostolic calling of Paul himself, both in the proclamation of Christ and in the coming to faith in Christ. His name is glorified. And I believe this does several things for Paul's declaration in verse 5. This idea that coming to faith and preaching Christ, it's for his namesake. First, it brings the authority of Christ, the authority of Christ into the discussion of salvation of these Roman believers. Jesus Christ, our Lord. It brings the authority of Christ when we know that this is done for the honor and glory of his name. The power and authority within the gospel to save sinners belongs to the king. It is the king who died for his people. It's the father God who draws sinners to his son so that they might be saved. Where Paul writes of that, this is all for his name's sake. We understand that the effectual call of sinners into salvation is an open proclamation and demonstration of the power of God to save. This exalts the name of the Savior. Salvation not only rescues sinners from the eternal condemnation of sin, it rescues us from the slavery to sin, whereby we turn to submit to the rule of our King Jesus. We are saved to deliver us from both the power and the penalty of sin. And this is done in the believer's life by the reigning power of Jesus Christ as his spirit enables his chosen and redeemed redeemed people to be transformed by the gospel. So this is all done for his name's sake in that it shows the authority of Christ in salvation. Second, it emphasizes the righteous character of of Jesus Christ our Lord. The righteous character in the calling of these believers to faith. We've discussed at some length the act of obedience in relation to saving faith. But we are also reminded that bringing sinners into submission to the Savior as our Lord is an act of His graciousness towards sinners. I think a sad reality found in the modern church today is that people want to be identified as Christian Yet so many that do so want to embrace an unbiblical kind of liberty where sin is almost made acceptable. Yeah, I want Jesus. I want forgiveness. I want to go to heaven. I want to bear the name Christian, but I want to live like Sikkim in this world too. I want to enjoy all the lusts and pleasures that are out there. And after all, Christians are under liberty, right? That's the message. That's the modern church today so often. Paul addressed this problem in Romans 6 where some Christians were struggling with the idea that they could continue in sin only to make the grace of God abound all that more. Paul condemns that idea. And he goes on to teach that being delivered from sin itself is an act of God's grace. It would not be gracious of God to leave us content in our sin, which would be a life that was most offensive to him. It's out of his love and out of his grace that we now are a people that live under commandment. We're no longer under the bondage of sin. We're under bondage slavery, Paul says in Romans 6. We're in slavery to the righteousness of Christ. This is what it means to exalt his name. It emphasizes the very character of Christ in his people. Therefore, though Paul, through his apostolic ministry, preached gospel faith as a command issued from God, he did so by grace and with grace, because Jesus Christ himself is full of grace and truth, John 1.14. How Christ is presented, then, must be consistent with his name. How we preach Christ, who we preach Christ is, and how I live as a proclaimer of Christ. It should exhibit the very character, the righteous character of our Savior. Third, ministering for the glory of Jesus Christ, testimony that he received grace from God and the apostolic ministry. Paul received grace from God and his apostolic ministry proclaiming the gospel for the glory of Christ. And therefore, we're ministering for the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. What he did, 
He did for Christ's namesake. Paul did not serve the Lord to be praised by men or to become wealthy because of his fame among the churches as oftentimes we see in the prosperity movement. He most certainly did not become a preacher or a pastor to enjoy a life of ease and relaxation. Paul in no way saw his calling as a means to acquire riches or recognition from the world. Rather, how did we see Paul's apostolic ministry? Much labor and a whole bunch of suffering. That described his apostolic ministry. So why would Paul do it? Why is he so eager to be engaged in this apostolic work? Why such hard labor and determination against suffering and persecution? It was for the glory of Christ. And from that perspective alone, Paul said, I am so honored to bear his name in much work, much suffering, that he could be glorified in the nations. If, as we've come to know, the name of Christ is an expression that refers to the whole person of the Lord, his character, his perfections, his work, his majesty, his dignity, his honor. And what Paul did was a service to exalt all that Jesus Christ is and does. It was his calling to make Jesus Christ known for who he is. Do we view our calling any differently than that? Do we see our service and our, our efforts any different than that? Probably. Many of us can't come to the place of saying, give me more work. Let me suffer so that Christ be glorified. In our closing moments as we prepare to take communion together, I'd like us to consider a few principles that are true of the gospel and they should be visible in our gospel witness. And again, when I say gospel witness, I mean not only the words that we use to communicate to the world the gospel, but how my life also communicates the gospel. Am I preaching the gospel? Am I living the gospel? And I put both of these, or all three of these expressions under grace and obedience because those two have been predominant in our study this morning. Both grace and obedient first of all, are part of the gospel call. Both grace and obedience are part of the gospel call, the gospel message that goes out from believers, from the church. In our proclamation of the gospel, we are making clear to the world that there is no other means provided by God to come into his grace, to come into his salvation. And not only that, to reject the gospel is a rejection of God's son who made possible the good news of God. And I understand that from our part as messengers, we are compelling people to come to faith. We might even say we're inviting them to come to faith. The world may see that as an invitation. But we understand it more than an invitation here. We are entrusted to go out into the world and proclaim a divine summons, a divine directive. Through our preaching of Christ, there is a command of God to believe. And to disbelieve will have eternal consequences. So there's a seriousness to our call that men and women must believe. And that urgency to believe is communicated. As we faithfully proclaim the gospel, we've got to speak about sin. We've got to speak about judgment, God's holiness of character, his perfect justice, and what that means from the cross of his son. We've got to speak about eternal condemnation. At the same time, we preach a graciousness of God to provide the rescue of men's souls from that which they deserve. We must communicate this gracious act of God, and we must communicate his message with gracious words. Is the name of Christ visible in our gospel call? Second, both grace and obedience are part of my calling to proclaim the gospel. Both grace and obedience are part of my calling to proclaim the gospel. Like Paul, every believer is an apostle in the sense that we are sent out by our king to proclaim and to represent his character and his redemptive work. Again, we are not in that office of an apostle. 
but all of us are sent out ones, messengers. If we're here as a believer, we are no more given an option to be God's sent out ones than was Saul when Jesus said to him, I'm going to show you what you must do. It's no different for us. Our calling isn't any less. The king has sent us out. At the same time, like Paul, how we need to see this calling is an act of God's grace to me. No matter what I have to suffer for it or how much work is involved, like Paul, each of us could say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. By his grace, I am what I am. He's called me into this. If we labor hard for Christ and we suffer much for doing so, that's God's grace at work. We've been privileged to bear his name no matter the cost. This is the name of our king that we proclaim. Is this how we see our calling? This is how I see my calling. And third, both grace and obedience are part of receiving the call of the gospel. Both grace and obedience are part of receiving the call of the gospel. Again, I think there is a tendency by some modern churches or modern Christians to speak of the gospel only in what we would say is gracious terms where obedience is minimized or rejected altogether. It's a soft-toned gospel that is only meant to tickle people's ears. And if we're preaching the truth of Christ, we are then preaching the lordship of Christ. We are saved for what reason? To make us obedient to Christ. That is the problem, is it not? We are sinners and disobedient to Christ. The transformation of our hearts. Remember what we heard in Sunday school this morning. The heart of stone is taken away. What does that represent? A heart that refuses to obey the commands of God. And God is righteous and good. So we're refusing the righteousness, the holiness of God. The Spirit of God takes that heart of stone away. And he gives us instead a heart of flesh. What does that heart do? It causes us to be obedient to the commands of Christ. This is what the gospel does. It takes us from being disobedient to now submitting to the lordship of Christ because of his goodness, his righteousness. This is the work of grace <clears throat> that the gospel accomplishes. Again, the gospel saves us not only from the eternal consequences of sin, it delivers us from the bondage of sin. We are graciously saved by God to obey. Are we graciously calling sinners to a life of obedience with the Lord Jesus Christ? This is the gospel entrusted to us as it was entrusted to Paul. Father in heaven, we thank you for this marvelous testament given to us through the hand of Paul, but through the inspiration of your spirit. As we move ahead in the study of Romans, I pray that you would open up our hearts to see the glory of Christ so that we can do all that we do for his name's sake, for his glory. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.